Now, I've heard of some talk. The streets are talking. Now, they're saying that cameras like the Sony FX30 and the Sony FX3 and some other cameras have internal RAW. Now, as somebody that has a camera that does do internal RAW, this is quite interesting, but I've kind of gone through the footage and I figured out it's not exactly what people think, but we'll get into it. One more. And before we get into this, it's probably useful to explain what RAW is in the first place. Now, whenever your camera is going to capture something that's in front of it, when you press record, it's capturing a bunch of light, it's interpreting it into data, and then it's putting it on your SD card. Now, that seems simple enough, but there is going to be a middleman between that equation. Once you've captured light, it's gonna compact itself into a set of rules. And now that's gonna be things like your white balance, your ISO, and your dynamic range, which is actually determined by that picture profile you're gonna be choosing, and different settings that are gonna be locked into place so, so all that information spits back out onto your computer in an image. Now with log, you're gonna get a little bit more flexibility. It's not gonna give you raw, but you are gonna have a slightly wider dynamic range. You're typically going to have the best color depth out of your log profile. And you're gonna be able to push and pull things the way that you want to, which most of us are used to. Now, raw is going to be a little bit different. Now with raw, you're still gonna have that middleman that's going to be there. However, he doesn't seem as glued to the ground. You might still have a set of rules when you first look at your image, but you're able to actually go underneath that you're actually going to be able to move that middleman aside and actually change a lot of things after the fact. Things like being able to change your ISO or your white balance. And typically raw formats are a little bit bigger and they have bigger bit depth. So you have more information to play with if you really want to dial in your image or you want to fix something that you might have screwed up. Now there is going to be somebody in the comment section that's going to have a way more technical way of explaining that. But for most of us mortals, just know that raw sensor data is going to be bigger. It's going to have more flexibility and you should be able to change a lot of the settings that you have in camera after the fact. Now in this video, I'm only going to focus on two different settings that you could change with raw footage just to keep things simple. One's going to be your white balance and the other one is going to be your exposure or your ISO after the fact. Now with raw footage, you should be able to change your white balance and get a pretty good representation of what it looked like if you actually change it in camera in the first place. And with your ISO and changing that in post, you should be able to get the same dynamic range technically as if you change it to another ISO while you're in camera. Now I am gonna take a clip of three different settings on this camera. We're gonna put it into DaVinci Resolve and we're actually gonna find out if that actually is the case. But also I brought my Atomos Ninja 5, so we're actually gonna see what the internal raw quote unquote, looks like in comparison to something like ProRes RAW as well. Now, unlocking the powers of raw footage out of your FX3, FX30, or FX6 is actually pretty easy. Essentially, all you have to do is go into Catalyst Browse, make sure you have your camera on you just in case you need a serial number, and then you could render out the files that you want to have in that raw format out as XAVCS files. You just put it into a location, then you can pull it up on your DaVinci Resolve, and it's actually pretty easy to do. Now, once you've done that, you can go down to your DaVinci Resolve tab, and then you can go and see the raw settings that are going to be in there. Now, you might be wondering, there's two different screens that are going on right here without me having to hook up in anything, and that's gonna be brought by our sponsor, which is Lemink. Now, Lemink actually makes these really cool, super thin monitors, which can act as extra displays for your MacBook. Now, for me personally, I have to do a lot of traveling, which also doesn't necessarily mean that any of the content is gonna slow down. And I find it a lot easier to edit with two screens rather than just using one. What's really cool about the Lemink monitor is that you could actually just attach it onto your computer, connect it through a USB-C, and it doesn't actually need any other power, although you have the option of micro HDMI, which I don't know, I don't think anybody uses anymore, but you can get this powered on from your computer's power and it acts as a second display. Even more so than that, if I'm working with somebody and I have to show them something, I could drag something over to the second display, rotate it around to the front of my computer, and I could show them that while I'm working on something else at the same time. Now your computer does need the drivers in order to make this work and it hasn't quite figured out DaVinci Resolve yet in order to use two monitors at the same time. However, I could edit on one screen on the display of my MacBook and I could use a second display to pull up any assets or if I wanna watch a YouTube video to keep me busy. Now if you guys do wanna know more about the Lemink monitor, I'm gonna leave my code over here. It's Kofi30, you might actually save 30% off of that. I'll also leave it in the description down below for those of you guys that might have skipped over this, but let's get back to the video and talk about some of this internal raw stuff versus the XABC. Okay, so we're in DaVinci Resolve and I have three clips here. I have one that's gonna have the proper white balance at 5,500 Kelvin. I'm also gonna have another one that's gonna be over here at 3,300. And then I'm gonna go way above and I'm gonna go up to 8,500. Now, when you're working with RAW or other cameras that can do internal RAW, generally speaking, if I bring back or I bring forward that white balance, all clips will actually look exactly the same because I'm using RAW sensor data. Now, I do already have my own Rec. 709 LUT that's going to be on here. There's no white balance changes in either one. And we're gonna actually see if there's any differences between the 
three clips when I bring all of them back. Now, we do have this first clip over here. This is gonna be 5,500. This actually can use a little bit of an adjustment. And what I'm gonna do is I actually might just white balance this, which is going to be that white backdrop over here. So that's gonna be the white balance we're going to use. Now, on this guy, I'm also gonna do the same thing. Take this guy over here, put it on the bottom here. I'm just gonna put this right here so we could see it. And then I'm gonna do that on the 85 Calvin clip that's gonna go right about here. And it's pretty much the exact same spot. Now, now what I'm also gonna do here is I'm gonna put the three clips beside each other and we're gonna see how different they actually look. There we go. And I'm just gonna full screen that. Now, as you can see, one of these is not like the other. Ideally, these are all gonna be white balanced to the exact same spot, which in theory, they would all kind of be the same tonality. Now, this one is going to be my 5500 Kelvin and that's gonna be one image right there. But you notice that when you come up from 3300 Kelvin, it doesn't exactly look the same. And neither does it on the 8500 Kelvin. Now, you might say that, hey, you are white balancing to a particular area. It might have different tonality that's on there. But one, it wouldn't be this drastic. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to put all of these at 5500 Kelvin and we'll see if these look any different. Now, as you can see, even when we go into our raw tab and we change all the white balances to be exactly the same at 5500 Kelvin, ideally in a raw scenario, they would be the same. But they also look a little bit different from each other, which means that it's not necessarily raw sensor data that you're going to be working with, which means that the internal raw, albeit it's nice to have those controls in DaVinci Resolve, you're not actually working with exactly the same raw as people think you are. Also, this might go without saying, if you want to white balance the exact same spot on both the image that's going to be XAVC-I and also the XAVC Sony raw that's going to be in there, they're going to look exactly the same from each other as well. I'll show you on the screen. Now I'm gonna have two more files that are gonna be here as well. One is gonna be at 800 ISO, the other one is gonna be at 200 ISO. And theoretically, if we have the same dynamic range and all else remains equal, if we expose at the same level on our meter, if I move my ISO back and forth, I should be able to get the same dynamic range or much less make them look exactly the same. Sort of like how the red cameras do with your traffic lights, as long as you're in a certain exposure range, you're gonna be able to push and pull your ISO and everything is going to look like everything depending on what you change it to. What you're going to notice here is that with two 200 ISO, you're going to have very, very clean shadows. But with cleaner shadows, you're gonna notice you're gonna have less dynamic range in your highlights. A lot of people like to argue this, but it's just a fact of life. Right about now, I'm still exposing for my 1.7 metering on both of these clips, and obviously the window of the back here is gonna be a little bit blown out. It, it's so blown out that I actually can't bring that information back. I've tried. Now, on the flip side, if I use 800 ISO, what's going to end up happening is that you're actually going to see it's a little bit better on the highlights, but you don't get as much shadow detail. Now, keep in mind, these are both exposed for 1.7. Even if I try to bring up some of that shadow detail, I'm not going to get as much. It might be a little bit noisy, especially because I shot this on the FX30. But ideally, if I want to move one of these ISOs to the other one, I should get the same look in terms of where my dynamic range is going to go. That's kind of not the case. The quote unquote XAVC RAW that's gonna be on some of the Sony cameras isn't necessarily the same as it is on using something like a red R3D RAW. In fact, I think that's the only RAW format that kind of takes on that form where it doesn't matter which ISO you're going to use, you can move that thing back and forth and you more so use your ISO as an exposure tool but not necessarily as an actual signal that's gonna represent in the RAW data. One might argue that Blackmagic RAW, the OCN RAW that's gonna come on the Sony Venice cameras and some other formats of RAW, you might not be able to do this as well. ProRes RAW, I don't actually think does this as well. But those flavors of RAW versus what a true RAW codec actually can do, there's a little bit more flexibility on the truer RAW codecs like an R3D, but you can still push and pull things quite differently on ProRes RAW, which we're gonna kind of go into next. But uh, I'm getting kicked out of here, so I gotta go home. Okay, so getting double booked at a studio means I have to go and finish the rest of this video at my house. But we are in the house right now and I'm simultaneously recording on XAVC-I on my Sony FX30, and I'm also using Pro res raw on my atomos ninja 5. now right now i have things kind of exposed to like 1.7 and you kind of see in that window i kind of have it exposed at the same thing and what i'm going to do is i'm going to put both of these clips inside of davinci resolve and see what we get out of each one but there's also kind of a fun fact here as well um when i disconnect the hdmi cable on this actual camera monitor uh the thing actually kind of uncrops i want to see if it does it in the middle of a take but watch this 
And now we're zoomed out. So if you are shooting a ProRes RAW, I'm sure there's a reason for it. I think mostly because the ProRes RAW kind of goes into the 4.7K, although it's a 6K downsampled sensor, which means it's gonna zoom in. Whatever that is, it does zoom in when you use ProRes RAW just on the Sony FX30. So uh, that's a fun fact. But let's go into DaVinci Resolve where Des Kofi is gonna be over there and he's gonna talk about the comparison between these two clips. Okay, so I have my ProRes RAW file here and my XAVC RAW file that's gonna be over here as well. And I might've mentioned loosely that ProRes RAW might have slightly more more dynamic range but honestly that was probably just a throwaway line it's not necessarily more dynamic range you get more color depth but not necessarily dynamic range and you can kind of tell over here we pay attention to the window and i go to my raw tab that's already open on the converted prores raw once i pull that back that's as much highlights as i could have and if i want to do the same thing on say the raw tab on my xavci and i put them beside each other they're going to look very similar to each other. You're going to get just as much information either or. Now, the color is going to be different because with ProRes RAW, you have to shift some things a bit with the color space transform. But in terms of comparing these two, as far as dynamic range goes from ProRes RAW to XAVCI RAW, the dynamic range is going to be the same. And I think that's just because it's pulling off of the same sensor. Now, what's going to be a little bit more interesting is going into, say, the color aspect, especially when we're talking about our white balance. For example, if you're working with something that's 12-bit, you might see a little bit of a difference because there's more colors to obviously work with. So we have our Cinema DNG over here, and uh, I have to actually convert ProRes RAW to Cinema DNG in order to use it on Resolve. That's why we're in here. And we got these both guys at 3300 Kelvin. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to bring this back into 5500 and see how that looks. So that's 55 with the ProRes RAW, and that's 55 with the XAVCI. Now, both these are quote unquote flavors of RAW, and uh, as you can see, there's a little bit more contrast in the XAVCI, where on this guy, it's a little bit flatter, but you actually could see that this has a little bit of a green tone, and this actually is kind of closer to what the scene looks like on the, on the native color. However, if I could make some tweaks over here, I could probably get the Cinema DNG to look a lot closer. So now I got both my clips at 8,000 Kelvin, and right here you're gonna see they're both very, very warm. The XAVCI does tilt a little bit more green, so I'm gonna have to shift the magenta, but same thing. If I wanna shift this guy back to say 5,500, which is probably gonna be closer to daylight, and then shift my other guy back, which 5,500, whoops. Gonna blow these up beside each other. They actually look kind of the same results as you're talking about with the 3300 Kelvin, where it's a little cooler and bringing it back. There's going to be a little bit more green into your whites and into your shadows, where here it's a little bit more magenta and it's a little bit more neutral, but you could always just fix that in post. They're not that different from each other. Now, the XAVCI being able to use that raw functionality inside of DaVinci Resolve is incredibly handy, especially if you want to have Lightroom-like -light controls. However, it's not exactly how raw works, at least the way that it's traditionally thought of and the way that it's kind of defined as. Now, with ProRes RAW, you're gonna have a lot of the same functionalities, just using ProRes RAW has more color depth in terms of being 12-bit versus the 10-bit that already comes into your camera. Now, that's not necessarily to say that 10-bit is going to be bad. However, everybody that's kind of saying that it's actual raw in terms of the camera, it's not exactly what it is. That being said, if you guys want to see more, especially in that ProRes raw bit, that was just kind of me kind of playing around with stuff. If you want to see more of that, leave a comment down below and I could kind of do a little bit more detailed comparison between the two of them. However, for the vast majority of people, you'll be fine on the 10-bit, even if it's raw or even if it's in the regular XAVCI. That being said, hope you guys enjoyed the video. At the very least, you learned something and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.